Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Brian Baptist Church for this, our Wednesday night service. Glad to have each and every one of you here. I am so grateful that uh, Wednesday was not Wind's Day. I'm glad we got that all taken care of on Monday and Tuesday, and good to have you, uh, you folks, uh, some of you, uh, back from your travels. Grateful for that as well. And so we're going to begin singing. Brother Carl is going to lead us in a song right now. Okay, it's number 145, 145. I love to tell the story, amen? Let's all stand, please. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory. Of Jesus and his love, I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story, twill be my feet. In glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story, more wonderful it seems than all the golden fancies of all the golden dreams. I love to tell the story, it did so much for me, and that is just the reason I tell it now to thee. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory. Tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story. Tis pleasant to repeat what seems each time I tell it more wonderfully sweet. I love to tell story for some have never heard the message of salvation from God holy word I love to tell the story twill be my theme in glory to tell the old old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story <laughs> for those who know it best. Seems hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And when in scenes of glory I sing the new song will be the old old story that I have loved so long. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory to tell the old old story of Jesus and his love. Amen. Wonderful singing. We're going to begin with a word of prayer. It has been a very, very busy week missions-wise, and I'm going to try to kind of uh, catch you up on that. Some news has been uh, really coming in quite rapidly. Uh, one missionary is, is headed to the field this weekend, and, um, and uh, another missionary uh, that was just here recently. Wow, she did not let any grass grow under her feet. I'll give you a little report on that in a moment as well. So let's have a word of prayer 
and ask God's blessing on the service tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we come before you to praise you because you are worthy of our praise. As uh, I was talking to the children in chapel today, uh, it doesn't say for us to be barely thankful. It says for us to be so thankful that we cannot keep a lid on it. And I pray, Lord, uh, that you would help us in our hearts and our spirits uh, not to become whiners and complainers like many of the citizens of our nation, uh, but help us to be thankful uh, for the bountiful things that you have uh, done for us. And uh, we may complain about the price of food, but we have it. We may complain about the price of gas, but we have it. And um, I just pray, Lord, that uh, you would help us uh, to keep things in perspective and for things that we have no control over, certainly to pray to you because you do have control. And so we ask that uh, you would hear us when we pray tonight, and that you would help us to pay careful attention to your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. And before I say anything else, even though I'd love to say a lot right now, Brother Carl's going to lead you in a song instead, so you may be seated. Number 455, 455, thy word have I hid in my heart. <clears throat> thy word have I hid in my heart, thy word shall not fall away, to grant with a saving of sin, and show me thy heavenly Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee, that I might not sin, that I might not sin, thy word have I hid in my heart. Forever, O oh Lord, is thy word established and fixed on high. Faithfulness unto all sin abideth forever nigh. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. That I might not sin, that I might not sin. Thy word have I hid in my heart. That morning at noon and at night I ever will give thee praise and shall be through all my days thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee that I might not sin that I might not sin, thy word have I hid in my heart. Through him whom thy word hath fulfilled, the Savior and morning star, salvation and peace have been brought to those who have stayed afar. Thy sin against thee, that I might not sin, that I might not sin, thy word have I hid in my heart. Amen. Okay, very good, wonderful singing. Let me do a few things uh, real quick here, and that's, does everybody have a prayer bulletin? Anybody need a prayer bulletin? You did not get that coming in the door? Just raise your hand, Brother Jim can get that to you. If you didn't get a prayer bulletin, do you need a yellow bulletin? Yellow bulletin is the bulletin of the month. And if you need that, we'll make sure and see if you've got that already. Mick says he would like one of those. Um, you know, as much as he tried to look at it through the view screen on Sunday, he couldn't see it from there. And so now he has one. And so glad to get that to you. Okay, uh, there I got stuff all over the pulpit here. Uh, let me start over here. Uh, we have a missionary headed to Zambia this weekend. They fly out on Saturday. This is Taylor and Norris, um, uh, Taylor and Lauren Norris, and family. 
And so they are flying out on Saturday. They are on their way to Zambia. And uh, so uh, they're leaving Saturday night, April 9th, 1045 p.m. Uh, that is Central Standard Time. They'll fly 15 hours. They'll land in Qatar. And they'll have a layover of five hours. And then they will have an eight-hour flight directly to Zambia, where they will arrive at 8.35 in the morning their time. Uh, trust you me, Mrs. Watkins and I have done this. It doesn't matter what the time of day it is. What really does matter and what your body feels is the amount of time you actually flew. And when you're going to the other side of the world, it is hard for that, the beginning to the end of the journey being anything less than 30 hours. It's just going to be long and they'll be blurry, and they get to do all that with three children. And uh, so it'll be interesting. So here are prayer requests. Uh, their their pre-flight prayer list is this here, that they have everything they need for the flight packed and in their proper places. Uh, that they'll have all their shipping barrels packed and sealed properly for the long trip to Zambia. Uh, they will ship on May 18th, and we'll get to Chipata, in about two months. And so that's all their belongings. It's going to take a while. And here's this is important. Um, see, go ahead, Jim. Uh, somebody tried to get in. Go ahead and open up there. Um, you can go look. Open the door. You can open the door, Jim. It's okay. Here's a safe person. It, um, oh, okay. Um, I did, they didn't come with a prayer mat, so I think we're okay. Um, anyway, um, so, so anyway, looking right here, here's a big prayer. They'll receive negative COVID-19 tests. Uh, now, uh, the children do not have to test, uh, but the adults do, so that could be an issue. Um, merciful flight attendants, um, because there's uh, everyone except for the littlest boy is supposed to wear a face mask for 30 hours. Uh, that's going to be a challenge for the little boy Enoch, who's three years old. And so anyway, so different things there. Uh, remember them in your prayers, if you would. A few other things. A little bit of a schedule change here. Uh, Mackay Creek Estates Bible Study uh, was scheduled for Thursday, 1230. This, not tomorrow, but the following Thursday. Well, there's a schedule conflict. And so it has been moved to one week from today. So for those of you who signed up for Thursday, it's actually on Wednesday. And so you may want to relook at that. And uh, there's still room here on the list for anybody who wants to help. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this sign up list here. And I'm going to put it down right here. And then let's see, Bob, can you give me a hand real quick here? Uh, right here on the Lord's Supper table. This is the latest prayer list, uh, prayer letter from Brother Ben Cooley. He is the church planting pastor that is coming at the end of the month. And so if you want to get kind of caught up on what he's up to, uh, we, want to we want to get those out to you. I have enough for maybe one per family, and, but I wanted you to have that. And again, remember, we're kind of handling his love offering differently. Uh, we're having kind of a month-long love offering for him, where in order to give to him, you're giving to the uh, you're giving to the Clifton J. Cooley Memorial Fund, and so if you put anything that says Cooley, it'll get into that memorial fund because that memorial fund is dedicated for Northwest Church planters, and this man is going to start a church in uh, Redmond, Oregon. And he's very excited. You'll read that in this prayer letter. He's excited because the church next door in Bend, Oregon, uh, Victory Baptist Church, Pastor Peel, has taken him on for support. And so everything is kind of in process right now. But we will, he will be with us all day Sunday, and I believe that's April 24th. And so just letting you know that. And, of course, Resurrection Sunday is coming upon us very, very fast. And so just uh, keeping you posted... Uh, um, on Sunday, we'll have a sign-up list. Again, it'll be an early service here, and then at 9 o'clock, we'll have the Berean breakfast. That'll be on the 17th. 
and a morning worship service, a, a celebration service on Sunday night. Um, Mrs. Watkins is re rehearsing a ladies group that's going to sing, a men's group's going to sing, the choir's going to sing. It's going to be a wonderful day. A lot of things that are going on uh, there. This, uh, let me make sure I get this here looking. Anybody interested in FBI, it is, it is sign up now. It is registration time for new students uh, right now. And of course that is for the fall semester. And so you may uh, want to look into that, uh, encourage you to do that. Uh, we will have an all church outreach the day before Resurrection Sunday, door hanger, a door hanger blitz, letting you know about that. This Saturday is a men's breakfast and a meeting. And so that will be coming up. One of the things that we'll be talking about, men, is we have a college intern coming. And uh, his name is Andrew Goodman. Uh, he came with the Passage Northwest one year ago at this time. Uh, some of you would remember him as the man who played guitar and harmonica at the exact same time. And uh, so he's very musical, but he has many different gifts. And uh, he's praying about what the Lord would have him to do. And, um, and he really needs, as he's, as he's looking ahead to the ministry, he's between his junior and senior year at Crown College. And so it'd be a good time uh, for him to come and it'd be good for us as well. So man, we'll talk about that. I'll kind of lay out um, what we're looking at, what he will be involved in, kind of what uh, my philosophy of interns is because I've had an intern before at a church before, so it's not my first rodeo. And so we'll have a chance to talk through uh, some of those things. So I uh, want, want you to know about all of those things going on. And the other missionary, uh, the other missionary announcement I wanna make is our medical missionary who was here a week ago Sunday. Uh, she has been peddled to the metal ever since. And uh, she has been in communication with Ukraine, with our missionary in Ukraine, uh, with uh, the pastor of the church that our missionary is in right now. And, uh, and Pastor Oleg said yes. And so there is a ministry team, ministry slash medical team, on its way to Ukraine uh, about two weeks from now. So it's happening pretty quickly. And uh, so we just need to kind of just pray for all the, all the items, all the moving parts that are happening with that. But uh, so things are moving uh, very, very quickly. And of course, uh, we pray earnestly for the Ukraine, just for all the, uh, the heartache that the country is dealing with. Um, I was telling you this, uh, Pastor Don Clark, who was with us last Sunday morning, he said, I just found out there are 2,800 Baptist churches in Ukraine. And so it is not a country where people are not working. The, you know, uh, missionaries have been working in that country, uh, working to evangelize that nation. And so it's important to know when we pray for Ukraine, uh, yeah, we're praying for the lost, but we're praying for the saved as well uh, when we're praying for that country. So Brother Carl is going to lead us in one more song here. Okay, it's number 529, 529, how firm a foundation. Let's all stand, please. <clears throat> how firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith. In his excellent word, what more can he say than to you he has said to you who for refuge to Jesus has fled? Fear not, I am with thee, O oh, be not dismayed, for I am thy God, and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand upon by thy gracious and bitter hand. When I call thee to go, the rain. 
as I love that song, I'm always inhaling to sing the final verse. Then put the final verse of the song in that hymnal there, and I like it because it says at the very, very end, talking about how it says, no, never, no, never, no, never will I forsake, you know, uh, what we're talking about, the foundation of God. Uh, if you have your Bibles tonight, and I certainly hope that you do, uh, please turn your Bibles to the book of First Thessalonians chapter 4, book of First Thessalonians chapter 4, looking at verses 1 through 3, First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 um, through not all of verse 3, but just part of verse 3, and I, I'm going to be dealing with, uh, with what I look at as an incredibly critical topic. Uh, it is something... Uh, uh, sadly and, uh, and tragically missing in large portions of our nation uh, regarding Christendom. And maybe it's because this topic isn't spoken of enough. So we're going to look at this here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, looking at the first verse. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ. That as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For we know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. I'm just going to read this next phrase, and this next phrase we're going to key on. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Let us have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray uh, that you would use your word in our hearts today. And I pray that you would help me as I speak of your word and I allow your word to be the authority. Uh, Lord, you have uh, pricked my heart on certain things and those things have caused me to draw certain conclusions. And I realize, Lord, that uh, some of the conclusions that I've drawn here will be things that some have never even thought about. But we do need to think about it. Because what is most important in our lives is that you are glorified and nobody else. So I pray you would help us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to talk about this very, very important word called sanctify. And uh, this word, we have a lot of words that are related to it that we understand. You are sitting in what we call a sanctuary. And that word is directly related to the word sanctify. And the word sanctify literally means to set apart as that which is valuable, sacred, a priority. And that is what the concept of sanctification is. And so right now you are sitting in a sanctuary. This is a place that is valuable in that it has been set apart and considered sacred because it is used primarily for the preaching of the word of God, for the worship of God, and for prayer. It is set apart. It is sanctified. Let me give you an example of sanctification here. At this time, I'm going to have Mrs. Watkins come up. She had no idea she was coming up. And it's always fun to be an involuntary volunteer. So, 
Mrs. Watkins is coming up here, and many, many years ago, we stood on a stage somewhat similar to this, and uh, there was an efficient, and that efficient said, you know, uh, do you, Mark, take the Debbie? And I said, I do. And she said, Debbie, do you take me, Mark? And she said, I do. And, but I want you to understand, the moment that happened, in my life, she was sanctified. And what that means is that she has been set apart above any other lady on planet Earth. In fact, there's even words in the vow that say, and forsaking all others um, only to thyself be true. There's words of that deal with. And so it's a concept. Marriage is a concept of sanctification where a man sanctifies the woman who is going to be his bride and a bride sanctifies the man that is going to be her husband thank you honey you may be seated in fact that is why there's a verse in scripture Hebrews chapter 13 4 and it says marriage is honorable above all and what that word literally honorable above all means by application is it is sanctified the institution is sanctified and what takes place in the institution is sanctified and so I want to speak about the critical value of the setting apart and the sanctification that is outlined in the scripture here and I'm going to deal with three areas here tonight dealing with this important thing about sanctification and how it relates to you and how it relates to me. So I'm going to have you turn to some primary passages. I'm not going to have you necessarily read every passage in Scripture that I have here. I'm going to have to read every passage I have listed here. But I am going to have you read this one. 1 Peter chapter 2, looking at verse 9. The book of 1 Peter chapter 2, looking at verse 9. And while you're turning there... I'm going to put a couple things here, and we'll get to those later. 1 Peter chapter 2, looking at verse 9. It says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, we won't talk about how peculiar, that ye should show forth the praises of him, who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And so it's important to understand that salvation has sanctified us, or here's where I go, salvation has set us apart. And before we receive Christ as our personal Savior, none of that verse applied at all. None of those things which happened, which sanctified us or set us apart, happened until we received Christ as our personal Savior. And by the way, that's done individually. That's not done by groups. That's not done by en mass. That's something every individual needs to make a decision what they do with Jesus Christ. And it's a great object lesson right now because we're talking about uh, Easter and Resurrection Sunday and the season of the life of Christ and the life and the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And people kind of ask questions, what's the big deal? And those that are sanctified, set apart, they know what the big deal is. Those who have not yet been sanctified, set apart, they don't really know what the big deal is. They don't understand why people are bursting a blood vessel about this big thing while they run around looking for their Easter eggs and their candied eggs and things like that. They just don't get it. They don't understand it. But you understand it, and I understand it, or at least we should. Salvation has set us apart in several ways. First of all, you look at that term, but she are a royal priesthood. And by the way, what is a priesthood? Obviously, 
when you look at the term a priest and you look at the Old Testament law and priests, they, they were representatives. And they were representatives of Almighty God. How can we be priests now? We don't have to wear funny hats. We don't have to wear funny robes. But what we do have an ambassadorship. And that is why the Bible says, it says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. And this is where the priesthood concept comes in. We are praying you, we are beseeching you, we are begging you because Jesus isn't here right now and we're begging you to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. And that is where we actually use the action and the activity of priesthood and ambassadorship. And so it talks about how we are a chosen generation and we are a royal priesthood. But then it also says this. It says we're an holy nation. And what that means is that we have a different patriotism that affects us. In the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verse 20, the Bible says this, For our conversation is in heaven. And um, I've discovered that I almost have to define the word conversation every single Sunday because it seems that no matter how many times I bring this up in Sunday school classes or in chapels or anything, I go... What does the word conversation mean? And they all stare at me blankly. And what it is, the old English word for conversation means literally lifestyle or manner of living. And it literally means that your life, your future, your home, your priority, the things that surround you, they're all in heaven. It says that your conversation is in heaven. And it literally means that Everything that really, really, really matters to you and about you is in heaven. Can anybody venture to say why? Because your life on earth is that. And what is amazing to me, somebody once called it su sacrificing all eternity on the altar of immediate because your life here is that and your life in heaven encompasses the universe because it goes on and on and on forever and yet what happens to you regarding heaven and eternity is all accomplished in this and that's why it makes it so important and so there's a different patriotism we have a loyalty to another country anybody remember covid anybody remember how much fun that was okay anybody remember something called a shutdown Anybody remember, you know, uh, they're trying to figure out what was essential and what wasn't essential. I did determine that apple fritters were essential during that time. Um, you know, there were other things that took place uh, during that time as we went through all of those things and how important it was to understand we had a different patriotism. And you're in there saying we have to shut down and hide under our beds. And I got tired really, really fast of shutting down and hiding under my bed especially when my Bible said not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. And then I realize I'm a patriot of a different country. I have a higher law. There's certain things I still have to do and I still have to accomplish no matter what is being said. And of course, we've been again accomplishing that anyway and then we discovered there's a whole lot of things we could get into there. But I don't have time to. But there's also this. It says this also as we look at at this it says a royal priesthood and holy nation a peculiar people and i'm now happy to ex explain to you peculiar the word means you're special okay and i realize it's all in the saying it's all in how i say you're special that helps you realize what kind of special you are but the reality is it says that a peculiar people means we are a special people and uh, the special people is described in Romans chapter 8, looking at verse 14. Romans 8, verses 14 through 17. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, father and what this means is when you receive christ you were set apart you were sanctified and you were made special 
as a member of a different family. Not just the blood family you have on planet earth, but you now have a family in heaven. You've joined a larger family, and that is the family of God through the person of Jesus Christ. And God, when you receive Christ, he adopted you and gave you his name. I'll get to that in a moment, and made you part of his family. And it says, and if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, we that we may be also glorified with him. For I reckon, I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to stop there because that is plenty right there. So, first point, we're through the first point. Salvation has set us apart. There must be a before and after in your life, a before you're saved and after you're saved, and you must remember the before and after. I remember quite clearly the before and after because even though I was only eight and a half years old, I knew what I was getting, I knew what I was doing, and I still remember it as clear as it was yesterday, what I did. And you know, if somebody says, well, I don't really know what I did, but my mom said I did this, that doesn't count. Because let me tell you something, if you, don't re if you don't remember, it didn't happen. Because you would remember, if you, somebody saved your life, you'd remember that. You wouldn't wonder about that. So it's important to understand the before and after and the spiritual condition, but when it happened, it set you apart as someone special to God. So that is you being set apart by God. Now that you're set apart by God, God also wants you to set yourself apart as well. So look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, looking at verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and looking at verse 14. And the Bible says this, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And of course, at that point, you go, why is that a big deal? And the big deal is because you've been set apart. That's why it's a big deal. God has set you apart. And so it's saying, remember, God set you apart. It says, be not unequally yoked with, together with unbelievers, because what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Have you noticed here in the United States of America that righteousness and unrighteousness do not agree? You know, that for some reason the woke movement does not agree with the word of God, and that people, there's a little bit of contention that takes place. And so, and then it says this, and what communion hath light with darkness? You know, how does that work? It says this, and what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Or what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? I mean, think about the temple of God. What's the temple of God? It says, for there is only one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord. Well, obviously, you can't then have the temple of God in agreement with the Heinz 57. You know, we've got 300 million idols. And, you know, let's all come together and sing Kumbaya. I'm sure we can find a, way, a common ground for agreement. No, you can't. And the reason is we've been set apart. And so then it says this. It says, for ye are the temple of the living God. You've been set apart. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. God's not going to say that about anybody else except for those who have received Christ. Not one other person. And then he says, okay, you've been set apart. So the next verse, set yourself apart. It says, wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord God, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And so, one, salvation has set us apart, sanctified us, but it is God's will that we set ourselves apart, which means we sanctify ourselves. And you know, how is that going to take place? Well, one of the things means is we have a different kind of fellowship. 
we just tend to rub shoulders with different kind of people for this reason. In 1 Corinthians 15, 33, it says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. And no, some people have used the term, they say, you know, bad company corrupts good morals. I, you've often heard it, you've heard it reworded, but it's pretty much the same thing. It's saying we have a different fellowship, and that is, you know, if you want to literally be set apart to God, you're going to have to think about the company you keep. And that doesn't mean in terms of witnessing and in terms of reaching out and in terms of trying to lead people to the Lord. But it is a problem if all your friend, if you claim to be saved and all your friends are lost, you know, what's going to happen? You're going to start acting like a lost person. Nobody's going to know anything. And so we have to deal with the fact that we are called to a different kind of fellowship, you know, who we hang around, who our vital relationships are with. And then not only are we supposed to do that, we're supposed to exhibit a different behavior. Jesus said in John 13, 35, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one for another. And so there's a different behavior that is supposed to exist in God's set-apart people. And this people don't like to talk about. Well, there's also supposed to be a different appearance in God's people. And everybody kind of wants to jump over that and not pay attention to that. But God's word says that, so we have to deal with that. It says this, abstain from all appearance of evil. It doesn't say abstain from all evil. It says abstain from all appearance of evil. And so you know, it's how do you appear? How does what you're doing, how does that appear? If a person sees what you're doing, are they going to be absolutely convinced you're saved or are they going to be absolutely convinced you're lost even though you say you're saved? This is something that we have to deal with. It's not something we have to deal with on the in outside. We have to deal with the inside. We have to deal with it on the outside. I always think it's really good if guys look like guys and girls look like girls. Just, you know, it's just me. No, it's just the reality here. Especially, I used to call it, 20 years ago, I used to call it the gender fade unit. I never knew they'd start switching genders 20 years ago. I even th that wasn't even a thought in my mind. I just had trouble when I saw a guy and he was wearing this unisex haircut and it curls around like this. And then I see a girl and she's wearing a butch unisex haircut and it's curled around like this. You can't tell the difference between a guy and a girl. It really kind of bugged me. And, uh, and now you really can't tell because you think it's a girl but it's actually a guy and you think it's a guy but it's actually a girl. So it's a real mess now. But for us, we came out from among them and we're separate. So with us, that really shouldn't be an issue. So, number one, salvation, being saved, God has already set you apart. And then God from heaven looks down on you and says, set yourselves apart. And then, it is also God's will that we set some things apart. And you go, what does that mean, Pastor? What I mean by that is God says there are certain things in our lives we need to set apart, just like marriage, and we need to set it apart, meaning that this has value and this has importance, and how we treat it is going to determine our value and importance. There's more than just a change in who we are or identity. There are certain, it's God's will that some things get set apart as sanctified and precious. And here comes five things. Looking in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, and I'm not going to read the entire verse. It's a common verse to you because you go, oh yeah, this is the verse we always use for witnessing, but I'm only going to use one part of it. And that is where it says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That's all I'm going to use. And it literally means, what do you do with the Lord God? Because it's important to realize that he's more than just God. He is the Lord God. It means he's the creator of the universe. 
He's the ruler of the universe. He is the savior of mankind. At least for those who will decide that they want him as their savior. And for the rest, he is the judge of all mankind. And what this is saying, you need to set him aside in your hearts. And what that means is you need to give God a special and valuable place in your life. That's what that means. It means literally taking the Lord God who created you, who saved you, and give him a place of value and sacredness in your life. And in order to do that, by the way, it's going to take a few things. That kind of setting apart is going to require time. It's going to require you and me taking time and communicating with the God of the universe and praying to the God of the universe and worshiping the God of the universe and getting to know the God of the universe. That is called the critical value of sanctification is taking the God who saved your soul for all eternity, who saved your life, and giving him a special place in your life. It's a whole lot different than rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub. The setting apart is going to require time. And it's going to require thinking. It's going to require focus. Do I have any married men in here? If you don't spend any time with the missus, or in any way, shape, or form, treat her like she's valuable, there is a payday coming. I can't tell you what that payday is. But there is that phrase, ain't mama happy, dot, dot, dot. Some of you know what that means. And the thing is, there's a payday coming if we as God's children don't sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. There are consequences. There's value to it, and there's consequences without it. That's number one. Number two. It's God's will that we set some things apart. Looking in the book of Leviticus and looking at uh, chapter 27, verse 30, and this one's going to be common to some of you because you've read this before. It says, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, it is the Lord's, it is holy unto the Lord. What does the concept of holiness mean? It means it's sanctified it's set apart it's set aside as being something that belongs to God and it's valuable to God just like it says in Malachi chapter 3 at verse 10 it says bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there be meat in my house it's the idea that we've set aside something of value as valuable for the Lord we literally have sanctified it. So, Pastor, is that pre-tax or post-tax dollars? And that's funny. Why do you have to ask? It all belongs to God anyway. So, I'm a pre-tax guy. I mean, God gets the first tenth. Before Uncle Sam gets his, I give God his. That's what I do. So, Pastor, do you ever miss it? Never miss it. I never miss it. It belonged to God anyway. I'm just giving God that which is God's. I give it to him. I don't even think about it again. God takes care of me. I can tell you that. Okay, so you've got the Lord God. We're setting him apart. You've got the Lord's tithe. We're setting him apart. And then you've got this thing called the Lord's body. Ooh. By the way, that brings us back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the very first passage we read tonight. First. Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4. And remember we were, we were reading here, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. But then it continues on. And it says that ye should abstain from fornication, 
that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. And you go, well, what's his vessel? I mean, do I have a clay vessel? Do I have a clay pot laying around here? Do I have a vase laying around here? No, your vessel is your body. It says you need to set apart your body as belonging to God, as precious and sacred and sanctified to God. And here in Thessalonica, that was a problem because there it was sleeping around was the norm. And so there need to be some teaching on this. And it says that you should abstain from fornication. It means those guys, those of you who sleep around, need to stop right now. Because your body now no longer belongs to you. You've been adopted into God's family. You're in God's family tree. You have God's family name. Your body now belongs to God. You need to set your body apart as precious and belonging to God. And it says this, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles catch this phrase, which know not God. It's kind of saying, hey, saved people, don't live like lost people. So this is important. And by the way, and, and there's a lot of things that people do to their body right now. I mean, people cut their body and people, you know, and you know, some people, I don't know how I feel about that. Um, you know, sometimes I'll see uh, ladies and they'll have earrings and, 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 and I don't know how I feel about that. I just know I'm never going to have earrings, ever, ever. And, um, and, you know, and what was so weird is for years and years and years, there's just one here, one here. And then all of a sudden they started doing the orbit. And I mean, they just started punching holes all the way around. And then they begin punching holes everywhere else. And then, um, you know, there was, you know, you'd have men, they'd come back from Paris and nobody in the United States of America had ever seen it. And they'd had some tattoo and it said mom or they had an anchor on there. And, uh, but then all of a sudden, about 20 years ago, there was an eruption. And they call it body art. It's really body graffiti. Not art, it's graffiti. It's kind of a way of, um, a person shaking their fist at God and saying, this is my body, not yours. See, I just made it mine. I want to tell you a secret. I'm getting a tattoo. I am. But not here. I'm getting it in heaven. Because Revelation... Chapter 20, a second here, I've lost my, lost my thing. Revelation 22, verse 4, it says, and his name shall be on their foreheads. I'm getting a tattoo. I'm not getting it here, I'm getting it in heaven, and God's going to be the only one who can put one on me. And so it's important to look at that. Well, why not do the rest? I'm sanctified. I'm supposed to be set apart as belonging to the Lord. So, you got the Lord God, we set him apart. Got the Lord's tithe, we set that apart. Got the Lord's body, you set that apart. And then, of course, you've got the Lord's house, which we've been talking about already. And that is, the Lord's house is set aside for prayer. Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. He says, it's set apart. And then we set it apart for consideration as it says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, which means we, we come in and we smile and we positively provoke each other. That's what we do. And that, that means is that we help each other, we encourage each other, and we exhort each other. And we do it with a smile on our face. And so it's important. Uh, by the way, community organizations don't rent our buildings. As long as I'm here, they never will. Why? Because it is sanctified. It's set apart as holy to the Lord. No, so we're not going to have a, uh, we're not going to have the National Tiddlywink Festival here. It's not going to happen, and we're not going to do anything like that because of what it is. So you've got the Lord God, you have the Lord's tithe, you have the Lord's body, you have the Lord's house. And then you have God's word. And what can we say about the word of God? And it's important to realize, this is a unique thing. 
God's word sanctifies us and then we're supposed to sanctify it. Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. It's from the word of God that we learned the gospel and received the gospel and became adopted children and became sanctified in the first place. But then, not only as the word has sanctified us, we are supposed to sanctify the word. And that means to literally hold the very word of God as something valuable and special and set apart in our lives. And by the way, what does the word do? Uh, I like this phrase here, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, and it indicates how the word of God works in our lives. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives. There's a sanctification part again. Even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might, there's the phrase, sanctify, set it apart as something holy and something valuable. I am so grateful that God has set me apart as holy and valuable. Because you know what? I don't always feel that holy. And I don't always feel that valuable. And that's why I'm glad God's done this. And it says that he may sanctify it, and then look at this, and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. And so, do you need a good scrub down? Here it is. Here it is. There is a lot of detergent in this book for a good scrub down. And so the Lord's word, it sanctifies and it washes and it's of such great value. And so you may go, Pastor, what are these things? Oh, let's see. Debbie Watkins. Wow, that's a mess. That is worn out. Where'd the cover go? And look at that. That's about ready to write, fall off here. This is my very first preaching Bible. It started with me in uh, the early 1990s. You can call it flappy if you want to right here. And, uh, and uh, if I were to do that, I have to be careful because the pages will fall out. Go, Pastor, why do they look like this? Sanctification. That's why they look like that. It's because for Mrs. Watkins, she took the Word of God and she sat it apart as something valuable and precious and holy in her life. And she read it over and over and over again until it fell apart. What about mine? Same thing. I preached, I preached in this book until the pages fell, fell apart. Then I got a second one. It fell apart too. I don't know where it is. I was looking for it. But it also fell apart. This is, this is preaching Bible number three. And it's going to eventually have some trouble as well. But why? And it, part of the reason is this. Psalm 12, looking at verses 6 and 7. Psalm 12, looking at verses 6 and 7. And the Bible says this as we look at this passage here. It says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. By the way, that's pretty pure. What that literally means is you purify the silver, you you heat it up, the dross and the slag rises to the top, you skim it off. You heat it a second time. Little less skim, skim it off. Seven times, it means to get the purest, purest, purest of the pure. And God is saying, my word is the purest of the pure. Purified seven, seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Well, pastor, so those are sanctified. Pastor, man, why do you even do that? I mean, think about it. 
you would never ever have, you'd never have a Bible wear out if you just got a Bible app. I never will. Ever. There's not one on my phone now. And there never will be one on my phone. You go, Pastor, why? Sanctification. You go, well, I don't get it. Let me help you understand. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. Samsung 9. Oh. Wait, wait, let me try that again. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. iPhone 13. You see, here's the thing. Or how about this one? The second Okay, I'm going somewhere. Did you see what he's carrying? He's carrying his smartphone. Do you think he might be a Christian? No, I think he may just be into Snapchat. You see... We do lose something to think about what we lose. All of a sudden, born-again believers all over the country, they can all go undercover. And nobody will ever know they're saved. And they go to Bible study. Nobody will ever know they're doing Bible study. So we do lose something. You need to think about that. Okay? And, you know, what about this? What about the pulpit? I'll never use one of these in the pulpit. I won't ever even use a, a laptop in the pulpit. Because you see, in God's house, you don't want an invisible authority. You want a visible authority. That visible authority is the Word of God. So you have to think this thing through just a little bit. Now, and I want you to understand, these are my convictions. This may not be your conviction. You may say, Pastor, I don't think I really agree with you. And I said, that's okay. You've been wrong before. How about devotionally? I mean, certainly there's nothing wrong devotionally. You know what I discovered? It's really, really hard to underline anything on my smartphone. And then if I do underline anything on the smartphone, it's still really, really hard to write in the margins on my smartphone. And, and maybe part of it is understanding this, because it's true in my life, I do some things that you folks don't do. You don't even have to do. But I know what it's like to have my Bible open to the printed page and a verse catches my eye and I stare at it and I stare at it and I stare at it until the screensaver goes off. Oh, that doesn't happen to me. And so I look at it, and I look at it, and I look at it, and I look at it until it speaks to me. I can't keep my, I can't keep my screensaver from going off in the middle of panda pops. And so it may be just me. And for some people, maybe they have preferences. But for me, it's a conviction. I don't want to lose anything 
when it comes to what the Word of God is. I especially don't want to be reading my Bible on an electronic device and then get, get interrupted by a call or a text or a comment or something like that. And the other thing is I have a problem with, okay, here's my Bible app and it's right in between Panda Pops and, and, and um, Candy Crush and it's just one of the boys. And I think I, for me, I lose the sanctification. And I think sanctification is an important thing. Um, in Faith Bible Institute, I never, I never tell the students anything. I, I watch everything. I never tell them anything. I just watch everything. Now I watch what they eat. That's fun. I, um, some of them eat things I'd never eat in a million years. Uh, I found out some of them are crispy, crunchy chicken fans. Those are good people. Um, but there's one lady, um, Faith Bible Institute, and she sits there, and while the guy's speaking, she pulls out her Bible, like this. And as he's speaking, she writes something in the margins. And I think that's a good thing. It'll be easy to get back to that. Let's look at Titus chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. Because I want to talk about why this sanctification and setting apart thing is so very, very important. Titus 1, looking at verse 15. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. And let me use a word to help you understand what is being said here. Nothing is sanctified. That's what that means. It means nothing is sanctified. Nothing is set apart as good Nothing is set apart as holy. Nothing is set apart as valuable. It's not there. And the consequences are in the rest of the verse. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. And then look at this phrase. Could be anybody. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate but the source is nothing ever sanctified and that is the critical value of sanctification a person who fails to sanctify will fail in all Christian identity and all Christian activity and so it is a very very important thing Indeed. Let us have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I come before you and I pray, Lord, that uh, you would be a help to us. It is unmistakable that things are changing around us and it is unmistakable that things will continue to do so. But I pray, Lord, that you would help us as a people who cannot be ignorant. That we would set apart things of you as the most precious and the most sacred and the most valuable. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us sing this song. Brother Carl is going to lead us. The song number is 207. Take time to be holy. Let us sing this song together. Take time to be Go. 
God's children, help those who are weak. Hither getting in nothing is blessing to see. Let's stand up, please. Take time to be holy. The word rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus above. By looking to Jesus, like him thou shalt be. Thy friends in thy conduct, his likeness shall see. Take time to be holy, let him be thy guide. And run not before him, whatever be tied. Enjoy or in sorrow, still follow thy Lord. And looking to Jesus, still trust in his word. Take time to be holy, be calm in thy soul. Oh, uh-huh.